Hey there, let's take a look at this extremely famous sonnet by William Shakespeare. Um, a lot of people know the first line, even if they haven't read much Shakespeare. Um, it's, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And uh, we want to look at the sonnet um, for particular, for structure today, to understand how sonnets are structured. But we're also going to look at, you know, any other poetic devices that stick out. And then we'll ask our three questions about the sonnet at the end to just sort of put the cap on it. Um, but this poem is, of course, a Shakespearean sonnet, so it's written in an A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G rhyme scheme, which is typically true of all of Shakespeare's um, sonnets. Um, and we see that it is divided, like a Petrarchan sonnet, um, into an octave and a sestet. Um, so we can draw a line right here, <clears throat> where we have one tone and meditation in the poem, and then it's followed by a contrast. We always look for yet, um, but, so, um, any sort of conjunction that might um, provide a contrast to what came before. In some ways it's helpful to think about, you know, this part of the sonnet moves downward, this part of the sonnet moves upward. That's not always true just based on the, the tone, but we'll see what's going on there. This poem is particularly interesting because it's built around one comparison. A lot of sonnets are intellectual comparisons. Um, and it's built around a comparison of the speaker's love, or I, I like to say his beloved, usually a woman. Um, he's comparing her to a summer's day. Um, and so we have this sort of interesting structure where the first line kind of sets up the rest of the poem. In some ways, Line one asks a question, and the rest of the poem answers the question, even though it kind of moves beyond just the question after the octave is over. But uh, the speaker says, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And so we have this sort of setup in some ways. We have the beloved, and we have a summer's day in which they're compared, and surprise, the beloved is better or greater than a summer's day. When you compare the two, um, we see that the uh, speaker definitely finds that his beloved is better than a summer's day for a variety of reasons. Let's read the octave and then come back and kind of translate it into normal English, if you will. The speaker says, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease has all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and Often is his gold complexion dim, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. So there's a lot of reasons here for why the beloved is better than a summer's day. Um, summer's days are lovely and temperate, but the beloved is more lovely and more temperate. And sometimes, you know, this is, this is sort of positive, I would say, sort of, you know, praising her. And then it sort of acknowledges, you know, something bad about summer days, is that not every summer day is beautiful. Uh, we get a uh, very vivid imagery, if you will. You know, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. This is what makes Shakespeare so great, is that he sort of like takes a big idea is that not every day in the summer is pretty, and he sort of like microscopically brings it down to buds of May and rough winds shaking them. You know, there's a lot of action verbs in that, um, that particular line. And so Shakespeare conveys the idea, the generality, that a day isn't so pretty, or summer days aren't always pretty, with specifics. Um, and then he gets a little fancy. He says, in summer's leaths hath all too short a date. Now we notice the period here, so in some ways that is one idea, right? I wouldn't draw a solid line. The, the octave is still not done, but one thought is complete. And it's actually in the may, maybe a really important thought is that time starts you know, creeping into the poem. We have a metaphor, um, and I do want to isolate that, is summer's lease. It's an interesting idea, it's very compressed into just two words, but the idea that summer just rents the earth for a little bit, and it doesn't, its rental doesn't last very long. Maybe in England it doesn't last very long at all because it's sort of more northern and it disappears. But it has too short a date. And that idea of time starts to haunt the rest of the poem. Uh, up here we had sort of the rough winds, a stormy day in May, down here we have days that are too hot. Um, I'm in the south, and so particularly that you know it gets very hot in the summer here. And we have, of course, another um, poetic device, which is personification, right? Instead of saying the sun, he says the eye of heaven, um, which is of course a metaphor and personification at the exact same time. But sometimes, too hot, the eye of heaven shines. 
and often is his gold complexion dim. Um, complexion also personifies the sun by saying it's got like a skin tone or something. Um, but this line does seem repetitive of the rough winds shaking the darling buds of May, but this one doesn't mention the sun and this one does. So Shakespeare's always kind of like saying the same thing but moving differently through it. Um, so all of this, all of these lines, are basically comparing the beloved to a summer's day. Um, and then he starts getting a little more general toward the end of the octave because something different is going to happen in the poem. Um, the poet or speaker acknowledges that every fair, and from that he means a beautiful girl, and every beautiful girl from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. This is a boat image for the most part, where if you don't trim the sails, the boat will go faster. Um, and so uh, nature is guided by time, and we can't trim the sails of time. It just keeps going as fast as it wants, and we just, we just age as time goes on. And our beauty fades, going back to those five great Renaissance subjects, where beauty is going to be in danger by time. So Shakespeare at first is just, or the speaker of the poem, is just praising the girl. Um, but then he's starting to get into what I would call sort of philosophical meditations of the relationship between love and beauty and time and death. So something happens, you know, looking at the structure of this poem, after the eight lines. Um, he contrasts sort of what he said before. He says to his beloved, But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou ownest. And that's a period, so that ends. We, we want to see punctuation as a sort of like musical notation. You know, it tells us where the measure stops, how long to hold the note, that kind of thing. He uses the idea of her beauty, he sort of metaphorizes it, into an eternal summer. And eternal is an important word in the poem. He says, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, and you will never lose the possession of the beauty you own. And that makes us raise our eyebrow a little bit. We're like, but you can't trim the speed of time, and so how are you going to keep your beauty? But Shakespeare's not done with like heightening his rhetoric. Shakespeare, of course, was a very good dramatist, but even in a lyrical poem like this, he amps up the drama. He says, you will never lose your beauty, and you will never die. I mean, like, one, it's impossible not to lose your beauty, but two, it's impossible not to die. He says, nor shall death brag, you wander in his shade. Now, notice, that's a nice little personification as well, that death is bragging. Death becomes a rival suitor that's going to steal his beloved away, kind of like Hades stole Persephone and uh, imprisoned her. And he's like, death is never going to be able to do that. Death can never steal you, nor shall death brag you wander in his shade. And here we get sort of the key to the poem, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. This is basically poetry, right? I'm going to write lines of poetry, and they will preserve your beauty, and your beauty will never fail. So we see that he is doing what a lot of Renaissance poets do, particularly Shakespeare, is he is solving the problem of how can love and beauty survive the predations of time and death by poetry. Um, so here, in some ways, we might want to draw a dotted line because he's kind of done the argument there. And Shakespeare often likes to flourish at the end. He'll have like two lines where he sort of asserts what he said or sums up what he said. Um, and so he says it in a beautiful parallel way. He um, celebrates the power of his poetry. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, meaning this poem, and this poem gives life to thee. Every time we read this poem, the woman to which he was writing is memorialized and kind of lives again in our imagination. And as cheesy as that might be, we are still reading the poem. So Shakespeare wasn't particularly wrong um, in that he wrote uh, something that stopped time. So looking at this poem, we see that it is you know, a pretty traditional sonnet with a, an octave that's basically a meditation on uh, how his beloved resembles uh, Summer's Day. Um, and then it turns into a meditation about the relationship of beauty and time and the power of poetry in the um, sestet. So I like to ask three questions. I'm like, what is this poem? Um, this poem, um, you know, or what, the, what is the purpose of this poem? This poem is meant to, you know, praise his beloved, show off his intellect, um, and celebrate the power of poetry. Shakespeare is a genius, um, I'll just say that, and I always tell my students that genius is very efficient and it's never just doing one thing. So it's doing all those things at one time of the poem. I like to say, where does this poem begin and where does it end? 
Um, the poem begins with a pose, like, let me just do this. I'll compare you to a summer's day, sort of an artificial intellectual exercise with some emotion built in there. Um, so it begins with meditating, and it ends with asserting the power of poetry. So it's almost like you want to say this isn't the greatest love poem in the world because it really turns into a thing about my poetry, but, and that, that can be true. Um, the other thing I like to say is what is the most important word in the poem? Um, I might say, you know, I think this is always debatable, but I might say it's the word eternal because it's repeated twice and repetition is always important. And the idea of my poetry will last eternally as will your beauty seems to be an important idea of the sonnet. Um, so that's our first little experience of a classical sonnet and a sort of standard one by Shakespeare. So thanks. <laughs>